Hi, my name is Ryan Guy. And I'm Tori Shimp. And today we're here to talk to you a little bit about how to give an impromptu speech. So first, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about why this is important. There's a lot of different types of speeches that you can learn when you first engage in public speaking, but impromptu is one of the most useful in the real world. First, as you practice giving impromptu speeches, it requires you to be able to organize your thoughts quickly. This means that you have to be able to make decisions about the information that you pr uh, present. So again, that's a way for you to practice your decision making skills. Likewise, due to the time constraints, you have to learn to prioritize the information that you put forward as you be get better at expressing your ideas. And most importantly, as you get better at this, you develop a skill that you can use in the real world, such as in meetings or just everyday conversation. So impromptu speaking works in the following ways. First of all, you'll start off with a random quotation and once you get this quotation, it's your job to decide whether you agree with the statement it's making or disagree with that statement. In the speech that follows, you will explain why you agree or disagree in three main points. As you talk about these main points, you'll want to use examples. The way that your time is split up is that you get two minutes to prepare and five minutes to speak. So the overall the format of the impromptu speech is as follows. You start off with a hook an attention getter that grabs your audience's focus and basically gets them to pay attention to you for the rest of the presentation. After you've gained your audience's attention, you go ahead and state the quotation. After you state the quotation, very quickly and concisely you explain what the quotation actually means. From there, you take a stance. You either agree with the quotation or disagree. Then, you choose your main points and preview them in a sentence. From there, you move into the body of the presentation where you talk about those three main points. And three main points can be a variety of things. We'll go into more detail in a bit, but it might be things such as a movie that proves the quotation true, a theory, or a background of a historical event. Once you've got through the body of the speech, which takes up the bulk of the time, you then move into the conclusion. The conclusion is relatively simple, but for the most part consists of summarizing what you just talked about and finishing with style. The introduction. The first part of the impromptu presentation is the introduction and typically takes between 30 and 60 seconds. Over the next few slides, we'll walk you through the introduction so that you know all of the important parts that should be concluded with it. So the first thing that you want to do in the introduction of your impromptu speech is to gain the audience's attention. There's a lot of different ways to do this, but some of them are, for instance, telling a quick story. Make sure that it's less than 30 seconds, but people tend to latch on to narratives, so that's a really good strategy. You could say another related quotation to what you're going to talk about, especially if that quotation has fidelity and is something that your audience has heard before. You can use a startling statement or statistic to kind of shock your audience into paying attention to you, or give the background on a current event that your speech is going to relate to. Last but not least, you could, in this place only, give a personal experience that relates to the conversation that you're about to have. After you've gained your audience's attention, it becomes time to state the quotation. You should state the quotation exactly as it was given to you at first. That way your audience has an idea of the topic that you were given to create this speech. From there, you want to spend a little bit of time interpreting the quotation. This is the place where you tell your audience what the quotation actually means. My suggestion to you is keep it simple. I've seen a lot of novice impromptu speakers that make a huge verbose interpretation of the quotation and all that really does is muddle everything up and make it more complicated than it needs to be. So my suggestion is when you read the quotation, simplify it down to four or five words and get it at the core of what the author was trying to say. So for example, if you look at the quotation on the right of your screen, the world needs dreamers and the world needs doers, but above all, the World Needs Dreamers Who Do by Sarah Van Brittock. Uh, so here we've got a long kind of quotation that could mean a couple of different things and ultimately you need to put it in what it means to you. So for me, I'd say what the author was trying to get at here is that you should be creative but follow through. 
From there, you're able to move on with the rest of your presentation. So once you have gained attention, stated the quotation, interpreted what the quotation means, now you're ready to go ahead and take a stance and either agree or disagree. Now, there's a bit of strategy that goes with this step in your impromptu speech. My suggestion is that you should take a stance based on what it's going to be easiest for you to come up with examples that either affirm or uh, deny that stance. So, for example, with the previous quotation, if you're interpreted the way that I did, is the world needs people that are creative that do, you might want to take a uh, negatory stance and say, like, no, we have to disagree with that, and then give some examples from either fiction or popular culture about people that needed to just focus on their creativity and not be drawn down by the need to produce something in order to be successful. Or you could flip it and go the other way and talk about how there have been great creative people that also have done amazing things inside of that and affirmed that quotation. Once you've taken a stance, however, you can move into the final part of the introduction and preview the main points that you're ultimately going to talk about. Again, a hint here, keep it simple. If you get too, too verbose, it's ultimately going to muddle up the beginning of the presentation. So if you've cho chosen three main points, you might want to say something along the lines of, hey, first we're going to go ahead and look at this, followed by this, and finally this. And at that point, you're done with the introduction and ready to get into the body of the speech. The body of your speech should take up the bulk of your time. You should spend about three to four minutes here, and over the course of the next few slides, we'll talk about the key things that you need to do in this time. So first of all, the body is the area where you'll talk about your three main points. So these are the examples that you've developed. One thing to know is that you should spend equal time on each of these, so maybe that means a minute each or a minute and 15 seconds each. When you're developing your examples, one thing to keep in mind is that the best points are specific instead of general. So for instance, if you're talking about history, don't talk about history in general, but identify a particular specific moment. Additionally, good examples are generally unique, so it's either something the audience hasn't heard before, or if they are familiar with it, maybe it brings a new perspective to it. And finally, good examples are varied, so you should try to demonstrate a range of different areas that you're talking about. So maybe something from literature, maybe something from popular culture, or maybe an important political figure. As you speak, you should put effort into developing each example so that your listeners get some background on your points. Don't assume that your listeners already know, for instance, about Martin Luther King Jr., but go ahead and give them some of those basic background details that make him a significant figure. As you're coming up with your examples, you can draw from multiple areas like historical events, famous figures, innovative technology, popular culture, or whatever other areas interest you. You should use examples that illustrate your interpretation of the quotation, so make sure that they actually speak to the point you're trying to make. Finally, as you're working your way through the body, you should keep the speech moving by using transition statements. These happen between each main point and serve much the same purpose as the preview statement in that it clues your listeners in to where you've been in the speech and where you're going. So that means the ideal trans transition statements review what you've just talked about and briefly preview what you're about to talk about. These should be kept simple and statements like now that we've looked at that, let's move on to examine this can serve you very well. Once you've wrapped up the body of your speech, you're going to spend another 30 to 60 seconds concluding and finishing things well. In the next few slides, we'll give you a couple tips at how you do that effectively. So first, the conclusion. The conclusion is very similar to the introduction in that you're going to do some of the basic things just in opposite order. So for example, as you move into the conclusion, you should give your audience some sort of a hint. I usually like a break light statement, so like, so today we talked about this and let's wrap up, or if you want to even be more simple than that, you might say, all right, let's go ahead and conclude this thing. Once you get into the body of the conclusion, key th three th key things that you should do. First, go ahead and either restate your quotation or interpretation, so again, that your audience is familiar what the whole topic was of your presentation. From there, review your three main points. Just like the preview of the speech, you want to keep this simple and concise. And finally, end with impact. When you want to end with impact, it's important, as we talked about before, that 
audiences tend to remember the first and the last things that you talked about, so let's make this catchy. There's a variety of different things that you might try. One, if your speech took on a more persuasive tone, you might want to end with a call to action, basically encouraging your audience to do something or think about something differently. Or you might try leaving your listeners with a thought-provoking question. Give them something to ponder as they go about their day. Or you might want to tell a story similar to you might have done in the introduction. Now, the best endings tie back to the intention getter. Some of the things that you might do inside of this is, for example, if you asked a rhetorical question in the introduction, you might want to answer that question in the conclusion. If you gave a statistic in the beginning of the presentation, you might want to tie back to that as well. Or, if you told a story in the introduction, you might use a technique to call the story sandwich to tie that up in a neat and creative way, and that is what we're going to talk about next. The way a story sandwich works is you open with a brief anecdote, and in your introduction you would tell only the first half of that story, get your listeners interested, but leave it at the moment um, of the cliffhanger. Then, in your conclusion, you'll come back to that story, finish it, and give your listeners the satisfaction of finding out what happens. We're going to hear an example of what a story sandwich will sound like. So in this example, imagine that I was giving you a speech about local humane societies. Hello, everyone. Moments before I came into this room today, I was given some news. It turns out that a local animal control officer found a small orange tabby kitten named Penelope wandering the streets and took it to the local Humane Society. Unfortunately, due to budget cuts, the Humane Society no longer has the budget to keep these animals alive for very long. And if in the next few minutes, Penelope the kitten is unable to be adopted, then she's going to have to be euthanized. At this point, you would continue with the rest of your introduction and the body of your speech, and then finally, when you're ready to conclude, you'd come back to finish the story. So, at the beginning of this presentation, I shared with you all the story of Penelope, the orange tabby kitten, and her sad fate. Moments ago, as a doctor walked in the room, euthanasia in hand, and prepared to inject Penelope the kitten, a family walked through the door looking to adopt a kitten just like Penelope. And so, fortunately, Penelope was saved. However, not all kittens will share the same fate, so I implore you, take action, support, support your local humane society. Now that you know about the major organizational structure of an impromptu speech, we have a few extra tips related to delivery. First of all, you can think of impromptu speaking as the cocktail conversation of public speaking. You can have a charismatic storytelling tone. If you're a nervous speaker, take a few deep breaths beforehand to relax, and if during the speech you find yourself stuck, go ahead and pause to collect your thoughts. Often these pauses seem longer to you than they do to your audience, and sometimes you even come across as more thoughtful. You can use your quotation as a touchstone for staying on point if you find yourself wandering during your speech, so go back to it just as a reminder of what you're really trying to say. Additionally, one last final tip is to say quotation instead of quote. Quotation is the noun and quote is a verb. In order to be grammatically correct, this is a good practice. Well, thank you all for your time. I hope you uh, have enjoyed the presentation and we wish you the best of luck as you move forward and try to give your first impromptu speech.